Hey everybody, it's Professor Palmer, and this is my online office hours for Intro to Sociology. I have four questions I'm going to answer today, and I wrote them all on the board back over there, so I'm looking at them right now. The first one is, what does it mean that no act is inherently deviant? Which is a great question. Um, so when we say that something is inherently deviant, we mean that just by being itself, it is that. That's kind of what it means to be inherent. Um, so if no act is inherently deviant, um, that has a couple of reasons. One, it's because for something to be deviant, it has to be not normal. For something to be not normal, we have to define what normal is to define what deviance is. Uh, what I'm getting at here is that deviance is a relative term, like hot and cold, um, or you know, good and bad. So uh, how we define what is normal depends on what we define as deviance and the other way around. So remember, deviance is the deviation from the social norms. That is that you um, are not conforming. You're deviating away from what the, everyone expects you to do. So uh, no act is inherently deviant. Uh, we talked about in class where well, people have said, well, what about murder? And we talked about the fact that like, um, if we don't use the word murder, but yet we talk about killing and just ending life, then the state has a monopoly on that. And as long as the person ending the life is a soldier, a police officer, or a executioner in the United States, that's fine. Uh, you know, that is considered non-deviant death. Um, so uh, there's really no act. I think we came up with a couple that were hard to defend, and maybe I could later. Um, but one of them I couldn't defend was necrophilia. I think that might be. Uh, I can't think of any examples of necrophiliacs. I don't even know if that's a word. <laughs> I just made it up. Um, but, so there's that. So no act is inherently deviant because there's no such thing as normality. Over time, normality has changed. Uh, it was not normal to uh, be distracted while you were talking with people. Um, it was not normal to, at one point in our um, development of modern language, we didn't use periods because it was assumed that everything would be read aloud. Um, so even just basic functions of English language have never been, uh, haven't always been the way that they are. Um, everything from how we act on a date to how we uh, interact with one another in the hallway to the relationship between professor and student, all these things change over time and there's not really anything that would be considered normal. Uh, I'll talk about one last one that came up comes up a lot. Well, what about stealing? Isn't stealing always bad? And the answer to that is no, uh, because before you can steal something, you have to have the social construction of personal property. Uh, personal property is sort of a figment of our imagination. Um, we decide that people own things, but many human groups throughout the you know history of humanity on Earth have not had um, personal property. Um, many indigenous groups to this day don't have personal property, um, especially the ones that remain, you know, I guess removed from, I don't even know how to say that, but remain uh, indigenous? Forgive me, I, I don't know exactly how to, how to phrase that. Okay, so that was the first question. Uh, the second question is, is, how is crime socially constructed? And that's a really good one, uh, because the point isn't that crime doesn't exist. Of course crime does. But the point that we're trying to make, and that we talked about in class kind of in depth, is the point that um, Ryman makes in the book, uh, The Rich Get Rich and the Poor Get Prison. And the book, the argument he's making is, is that if we think of uh, crimes as being designed to protect us from harm and to protect our property, then we would uh, assume that crime punishments would be most severe for things that pose the greatest threat to life and limb or pose the greatest threat to property. But when we look at you know, where the death comes from in the United States, uh, Ryman talks about the fact that uh, six uh, deaths, sorry, every hour two people die of murder in the United States and six people die from work-related you know, causes. And so your job you know, organizations are far more likely to um, kill you than an individual is. But yet, we have almost no punishments. I think the 
uh, the, the great quote was that you, if you were woefully negligent and criminally negligent, I should say, and did not follow standards that have been set, if you're not abiding by the laws, that the the maximum penalty you could get, I think it was, I can't remember what it was, but I think it was like six months in jail, which is half of the maximum penalty you could get for harassing a wild burrow on federal lands. Uh, I, I, so basically, it's nothing. Um, there was another one that said that there, you have, uh, business owners have a higher likelihood of winning the lottery than they do of doing time for uh, employee death. And we don't think about employee death as murder, um, by and large. Uh, if the thought experiment we try to like talk through in classes, if I don't uh, put manhole covers on, you know, in my facility or whatever, <laughs> hypothetically, and one of my employees falls through and dies because I decided I didn't really want to put manhole covers. Do they call manhole covers anymore? I don't know. Is that sexist language? I don't know. Anyways, uh, the the covers. If uh, they don't, if we if we leave a giant hole in the ground and one of our employees falls through and dies, did I commit murder? Now, what if it was outside and a child fell through the hole? Did I commit murder then? Uh, who's is it okay that I let my employees die because of my negligence? Is it okay that I let children die because of my negligence? And where does it become murder? Um, and can I be convicted of murder if I don't personally, with my own hands, or with my own direct actions, kill someone? Um, and that kind of gets at the idea of murder being this thing that is less obvious and less clear-cut and more socially constructed. Murder, then, is whatever we decide it is as a, as a community. Um, which is not something we often talk about uh, with crime. We don't think about the fact that we decide what is a crime and what the justifiable punishments for those crimes should be. And all of that is, is uh, socially constructed. Um, so when we say crime is socially construct constructed, we're also talking about um, how we know what, who's committing the crimes, what crimes. So crime is socially constructed, and then I'm trying to like segue over to talking about a question that wasn't asked, which is how is the criminal socially constructed, um, which is similar. So first we define what crimes are worthy of our time and attention and punishment and which ones aren't. And then we define, well, socially, when who, uh, who should we punish for the crimes that they commit um, so when some people commit the crimes, we don't punish them, and when other people do, we do. Um, and we talked about a few reasons that. So check your lecture notes. We'll, we'll maybe talk about that uh, later. Hang out, but but they're both connected. The big idea to take from the last half of module three is that crime is socially constructed, and the criminal is socially constructed. Not every crime, not every loss of life or damage to property is uh, punished. It's not all punished the same. It's not all punished based on how severe it is, uh, how much loss of life there is, and how much loss of property there is. And on the other side, we have the social construction of the criminal, which is we don't punish everybody. Some people get to commit crimes, and they don't get punished, or if they do get punished, it's a lot less time, uh, a lot less severe. Um, and we don't even try to catch everybody. There are some people who get to commit crime practically in the open because they are simply just not being pursued by um, the same degree of, you know, Police, they're not receiving the same degree of police attention nor prosecution. So, there's that. All right, uh, another question that came actually just from today, which is what is SES? Uh, SES is an acronym for socioeconomic status. It's kind of confusing because socioeconomic is kind of one word, but socioeconomic status. Basically what that is, is it's a way of us to rank people in classes. To uh, remember, Weber said that a class is people with similar life chances. Well, depending on how much education you have, depending on the job you have, and depending on uh, how much money and resources you have available to you, that's definitely going to affect your life chances. Um, and so, when we're trying to quantify that, we ask people questions about how much education they've had, um, how much net worth they have, which is, you might remember net worth is uh, income plus assets 
or sorry, income plus wealth minus debt. Um, and the third thing is, uh, I already said the three. So those are the three: occupational prestige, education level, and net worth or income and wealth. Whatever you want to say that. So those are the three, and that's how we figure out where people are in classes. It's it's a rough measure. It's not perfect, and there are some issues with it for sure. But that's the, the approach we take. Okay, my fourth and final question. We're breezing through these. Is uh, my one I get a lot, which is how do I know what class I am? Am I middle class? Am I lower class? Am I upper class? Am I the one percent? Am I the you know hundredth percentile? What am I? Where where am I at on that? Uh, and the answer is uh, goes back to the SES, right? You have to kind of factor in both your income, your wealth, your education, and um, the your occupational prestige. And so right now, most of you don't have very much occupational prestige. I know some of you do, but some of you don't. You might not even have a job, or if you do, it might be you know kind of food service or something like that. Um, but if you're trying to figure it out for your family, then maybe that's something else. Uh, but here's the thing. SES is an imperfect measure. It's also unclear even when we have people in, like if we can get everyone's job, occupational prestige, everyone's uh, income and wealth, net worth, and everyone's years of education and put them into a, a scheme, well, if you imagine that there's like a, a gradient that goes all the way up, well, how do you know like where one quintile stops and the next one starts? I mean, we can do that mathematically, but that's kind of an arbitrary decision. Um, so when students ask me, am I middle class or working class or am I upper class or am I upper upper class or am I lower middle class or am I you know upper lower class or whatever it is, um, the answer is we don't know. Uh, it depends on how you look at it. It depends on how you define the term. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that when we ask, depending on how we ask, over 90% of people will say they're middle class. And so as a nation, we seem to have like a desire to all be middle class. Um, even rich people don't want to be rich, apparently, and poor people you know, don't want to be poor. And that kind of makes more intuitive sense. Um, but those are kind of the big, broad strokes. Uh, if, if I didn't get your question answered, uh, please send me another one. Uh, you know how to get hold of me, but it's npalmer at georgiasouthern.edu. You can also tweet me, uh, npalmergsu, and uh, I'll try to answer it. Uh, again, you can also hang out with me right down here at the bottom, uh, here on this Google Hangout. So maybe we could do that too. That'd be pretty rad. But uh, with that, um, I will see you guys next time.